NTV Television Network presents. The other day, current era, 1975. Translation and voiceover by BMI Russian. Good evening. You're watching episode 15 of our series, the other day, 1961 to 1991, current era. Events, people, and occurrences which define the lifestyle. Things that we can't imagine ourselves without, let alone comprehend. And this time we're covering 1975. The Verkhovina 5 moped, Saurian oil, the Helsinki Accords, MIDI and Maxi skirts, stamps to buy butter and sausage, the Soyuz Apollo mission, Veronika Mavrikovna and Avdati Nikitichna, Franco's passing, recycling books, Pogacheva's stage debut, the show Yarlash, socialism in Cambodia and Laos. Commenting we have actress Tatiana Trubich, political expert Sergei Karaganov, Central Committee member, Foreign Affairs Minister Raoul Leroy and other officials. Televised musicals and plays become a trend. Popular drama theater actors were now dancing and singing verses. Soviet TV musicals tended to be based on classic vaudeville, with the genre being epitomized by the straw hat. When she was gone, that pretty lady was the object of such intense fighting and drama, which is precisely what set the plot into motion. This wave of televised vaudevilles confirms the fact that our cinema was more actor-focused. Intrigue and direction wasn't of much concern, the camera just sat there, while the cast was star-spangled in sticking to the rules of the old repertory theater. People's favorites would wear tailcoats and crinolines, top hats and jabots, ride in carriages, and always taking part in the performance, you'd see the main charmer, Andrei Mironov. The manner in which he nonchalantly sang became the Soviet standard for singing in film. Coletta, Coletta, Claretta, Floretta. 1975 marked the debut of the Lvov motorcycle plant's latest creation, the Verkhovina 5 moped, a Soviet youngster's dream. This was the country's most popular brand of moped, with two horsepower and a top speed of 30 miles an hour. The key features which distinguished the Verkhovina from other mopeds, an extended saddle, horizontally mounted fuel tank, and steering handles located higher than usual. This made the moped look more like a real motorcycle. In order to score a Verkhovina, kids in the city would try really hard to get good marks by the end of the 8th grade. Meanwhile in the village, grown men would ride mopeds to get from one settlement to the next. Women would sometimes hop onto bicycles, while for some reason mopeds were considered to be a strictly male mode of transportation. In 1975, another two countries, Laos and Cambodia, firmly planted themselves onto the path towards building socialism. After North Vietnam's victory over the South, American aid was withdrawn from other countries of Southeast Asia. Meanwhile, China, Vietnam and the Soviet Union continue to support the liberation movements in Laos and Cambodia. Guerrillas take control over their entire territory, and the age-old monarchy is dismantled in both countries. In December, they announced the formation of the Lao People's Democratic Republic and Democratic Kampuchea, which was the new name for Cambodia. Socialism prevailing in Laos and Cambodia was the logical consequence of the war in Vietnam. These two nations were drawn into the war by the United States. Cambodia served as a corridor for supplying weaponry, and as a result they bombed the hell out of it. Laos was also subject to bombing, society was left in ruins. Given the situation, these two countries, which relied on support from China and the Soviet Union, they had no choice but to turn to socialism. This appeared to be a victory for socialism, and even a victory for the Soviet Union, with the United States being defeated. In reality, the situation was slightly different. In fact, the people of Cambodia and Laos had lost once more. This was an especially painful loss for Cambodia. What with the Pol Pot massacres happening that cost millions of lives? Socialism prevailed indeed, though this was a Pyrrhic victory and socialism's last victory ever. 
During the mid-70s, any and all high-quality sweets disappear from stores. Enchantress, Nesnaika, Red Riding Hood and Knight were no longer anywhere to be found aside from the fairy tales they were derived from. Squirrel, Clumsy Bear and Northern Bear returned to their home in the forest. And only cafeterias at theaters kept souffle, truffles and chocolate-coated caramel in stock. Mass consumers were only offered popular brands of sweets. Spring, Sunrise, Mir, Cornflower. With most of them being filled with white fondant, the only available sorts of caramel were of the hard variety, pear or barberry, or with fruit filling, such as Victoria or cherry. The more highly valued crayfish and goose legs were also in short supply. Neither production output nor the product range was reduced, with the industry working away at full steam. One new construction project of the period was a gigantic candy factory called Russia and located in Kuibyshev. The problem was that more and more people were able to afford quality sweets. Dunka's Joy, which didn't even come with a wrapper and cost between 90 kopecks and a ruble 10 per kilo, remained to be the cheapest option, while boxed sweets which people would hand to machinists, doctors and director's secretaries as a gift, those disappeared for good. In the winter of 1975, two movie theaters in Moscow and one in Leningrad began screening a film called Mirror, directed by Andrei Tarkovsky. Considered to be the most exquisite movie shot in the Soviet Union. By early 1975, Tarkovsky's films had already received 22 prizes, albeit at foreign film festivals. Freestyle autobiographical storytelling was a peculiar thing for a Soviet cinema. Margarita Terakova plays a young mother, who also happened to be the main protagonist's wife. The main character himself never appears on screen. His voice was provided by the Soviet Union's most prominent intellectual, Inokenty Smoktunovsky. Yes? Alexei? Hello. What's wrong with your voice? Are you ill? I'm fine. Must be a sore throat. I haven't spoken to anybody for three days now. Attracted by rumors of Tarkovsky being regarded as a genius in the West, the movie-going public rushed to theaters, only to be left bewildered for the most part, watching Tarakova wash her hair while the ceiling falls under her. The state film committee suggested that the director remove any and all mysticism from his movie. Nineteen seventy-five brought with it yet another World Chess Championship game. Three years prior, Robert Fischer became champion after gaining a decisive victory over Soviet Grandmaster Boris Spassky. The International Chess Federation, the FIDE, assumes that opponents would be squaring off until six wins, with an overall limit of 30 games. Fischer sent a telegram consisting of 803 words, where he insisted they play until 10 victories, with no limit to the overall amount of games and Fischer keeping his title if the score reached 9-9. Nine to nine. This meant a two-point handicap. In other words, the challenger needed to achieve a score of 10-8 to eight in order to win. So during an FIDA Congress, a compromise decision was worked out. Competitors would play until 10 victories, with a game limit of 36. The handicap clause was rejected. Fischer sends a second telegram, and this time he made it short. Since his propositions were declined, he decided to relinquish his title of world champion. Such an unprecedented ultimatum posed a serious threat to the decades-old rules for holding chess championship games. In the wake of intense effort on behalf of the United States delegation, a second vote took place. However, the ruling remained the same. The FID urged Fischer to rethink his decision and concede to the world of chess, but Fischer kept silent. The final match of the candidates' championship ended with a win for Karpov over Karchnoi, after which the chairman of the federation, former world champion Max Uwe from Holland, states that if Fischer doesn't accept the FID's terms by April 1st, that'll make Karpov champion by forfeit. On March 17th, despite objections from the Soviet Chess Federation, an emergency FIDE conference is summoned. The federation accepted Fischer's demand for an unlimited match, 
but again declined his two-point handicap proposal. Fisher kept silent, and on April 3rd, 23-year-old Zlatos native Anatoly Karpov is declared the 12th world chess champion. The world chess crown, with it bearing ideological significance, found its way back to the USSR. Everybody was aware that Fischer was a nut job, but regardless, an absence of real competition somewhat spoiled the victory. Folk artists Vadim Tenkov and Boris Vladimirov garner considerable success thanks to their characters. The pretentious old lady Veronika Marikivna and the simple granny Evdotya Nikitichna. Chatting on a bench in the yard as a form of stage dialogue. Nikitichna was a pragmatic know-it-all, while Mavrikivna constantly got everything confused, but loved to argue anyway. I'm also hoping to hear your rendition, but what about me? Yours too, yeah. Your rendition of olden rhymes on current topics. Mavrikievna and Nikitichna were citizens in a solid society. They discussed the TV adaptation of the Foresight Saga, Aki Three Stars, as well as static electricity on nylon blouses. Tourists from the Soviet Union begin to visit socialist countries en masse. Now thousands of people were able to afford to spend 300 rubles for a tour and another 300 to 330 rubles on local currency. Also, such trips potentially made economic sense thanks to the fact that certain goods which were uncommon in the USSR cost cheap in fraternal countries. That's what you'd call justifying your ticket. The main destination of choice was sunny Bulgaria. Starting in 1975, the tiny Balkan nation annually welcomed a quarter of a million Soviet tourists. Trips to Bulgaria seemed to be more in line with the concept of tourism, since the assortment of local goods wasn't as vast compared to East Germany, Czechoslovakia or Hungary. For one week you'd explore the country, and then spend another two relaxing on the Black Sea coast. The most popular tours were allocated either via trade unions or the Sputnik Bureau in the case of young tourists. A proper foreign country had to have an impressive abundance of consumer goods. This wasn't quite the case around here, though supply wasn't as bad as in our country. Also, a proper foreign country meant an air of animosity, but around here anti-Soviet attitudes were non-existent. Not surprisingly, since we did save their skin twice. The people in a proper foreign country had to speak an incomprehensible tongue. Here, though, the language was easy to understand. Plenty of people knew Russian, plus they used the Soviet alphabet. The doctrine of limited sovereignty is described in a proverb which rhymes if you replace Bulgaria with any other socialist country. Nevertheless, a chicken is not a bird, and calling Bulgaria a foreign nation is absurd. Those who had visited Bulgaria before usually returned just for the sake of recreation. They were provided with direct flights to coastal towns such as Varna and Burgas, and every middle-class Soviet citizen was aware of resorts such as Albena, Druzhba, Golden Sands and Sunny Beach. Slinch of Bryag or Sunny Beach, Bulgaria's most renowned seaside resort, where the hotels had such familiar names as Falcon, Meteor, Eagle, was regarded as a better version of Sochi. With sand instead of rocks, the comfort of a hotel instead of having to rent a private residence, produce and beverages were in relatively abundant supply, with more than just one brand of bottled beer available. You were able to choose which restaurant or bar to go to, and none of them would have signs saying no vacant tables. You'd see plenty of Poles, Czechs and East Germans, reaffirming the world-class caliber of such a vacation. Leonid Ilyich Brezhnev bestows a gold star medal upon Todor Zhivkov. Nineteen seventy five was a remarkably successful year for Soviet club soccer. That was when Dynamo Kiev won first the European Cup Winners' Cup and later the European Super Cup. 
The Kiev-based team methodically beats out the national championship winning teams from Bulgaria, West Germany, Turkey, Holland, to then demolish Ferencvaros from Hungary in the finals, with a score of 3-0. During the Super Cup games, Dynamo Kiev attains two victories over European Cup winner Bayern Munich, scoring 1-0 and 2-0. All three of those goals were scored by Oleg Bluchin. He was even recognized as Player of the Year and awarded the Golden Ball Prize in 1975. Bluchin is one of the great Soviet soccer forwards, though not everybody was cool with his style of playing. Dynamo Kiev was the backbone for the USSR national team. During some games, the national team consisted entirely of players from Dynamo Kiev. The team was led by senior coach Valery Lobanovsky. The film Earthly Love based on a novel by Pyotr Proskurin, was an epic melodramatic love story focused on a collective farm director and set before the war. The movie attracted 65 million viewers in 1975. The film's director Yevgeny Matveyev also starred in the lead role. The main character had a wife and four kids, which didn't stop him falling in love with another woman. The district committee secretary really wanted to help out of understanding, while a former White Guard member who reached the rank of village council chairman was up to sabotage. Matveev's character stays in his family and in the Communist Party while quitting his job as collective farm director. Based on reverse psychology, Maxi becomes a short-lived fashion trend. Up until that point, skirts were on their way up. But many skirts had reached their limit, plus people were a bit fed up with them. On the other hand, maximum length was a rather curious look. The first to come out were coats, followed by skirts extended all the way to the ankles. Then the extreme Maxis were replaced with a happy medium in the form of the so-called midi skirt that went halfway down the calf. In the mid-70s, bell-shaped skirts were at the top of the heap. They'd often have a striped or crisscross pattern. Fashion-minded ladies who were into DIY would use complex patterns to put together spiral midi skirts. When you nailed it, you'd get a rotating skirt effect while walking around. The mini skirt had indeed reached its limit. Any more and they would have started becoming a nuisance. The rules of etiquette had also changed. Ladies would hesitate to go through doors or upstairs in front of men. It was virtually impossible for them to use public transport. And midi skirts were a game changer. Their appearance corresponded with changes in how women viewed the world. They were getting all serious, choosing serious trades. And then come midi skirts, which really saved the day. In the ninth and 10th grade in workshop class, we'd learn how to sew. And the go-to item was always the so-called bell skirt for which you'd need to buy material of two different lengths, 27 and 30 inches. You'd fold them like an envelope, put down one stitch, and stick on a zipper. But you still weren't allowed to wear them at school, since uniform dresses were still a thing, them tending to be quite short. And let's not forget about Jan Bolotova, who starred in Sergei Gerasimov's movies. She was always this fresh and elegant woman of the future, wearing her midi skirt, which was already borderline maxi, covered with a soft jersey, complemented by a soft jumper up top, genuine leather belt, similar to what a man would wear. Now, she knew how to behave herself. She figured out a new way to build relationships with men. She was a true woman of the future and a role model. For 40 years, the Soviet people were very much fond of the Spanish. We still remembered how in the 30s there were international brigades, pilots' caps with paintbrushes, Spanish kids in Soviet orphanages, the inter-brigades were subdued by the Falange movement, and since then Spain had been run by Caudillo Francisco Franco Bamonde. But in 1975 Franco's rule came to an end, due to his death. 
The message about Franco's death was communicated together with news on the future oath of the nation's new leader, Prince Juan Carlos, who was to become the King of Spain. Casual Soviet observers saw this to be the reinstatement of monarchy, a system which was at least as reactive as Franco's regime. Soviet newspapers weren't too keen to write about Juan Carlos's first initiatives, in the form of abolishing the death penalty, an amnesty, and legalizing political parties and trade unions. A clearer indication of the changes occurring was the fact that one of the Spanish Communist Party Party leaders, the famous Dolores Ibaruri, who had been living in our parts since the 1930s and was already in her 80s, returned to her homeland from her exile in Moscow. The passion flower carries on with her struggle. That's the explanation they gave when she was leaving. From October of 1974 and up until July of 75, there was an experimental program for selling especially highly demanded books in exchange for old recycled material. And in the end, this experiment was deemed to be successful. From then on, it became standard practice to issue a book stamp for every 20 kilos of recycled material handed in. The top eight list of recycling program bestsellers included works by Ilfan Petrov, Alexei Tolstoy, Conan Doyle, Voynich, Dumas, Coilins, plus two issues of Tales by Anderson. Anybody who hands in 20 kilos of recycled book paper receives the right to purchase a rare book plus 40 kopecks in cash. The right to own Queen Margot, the woman in white, or Ayalita could have been earned by patiently waiting. Or if you just paid for it. Lines would form in front of paper recycling centers, while scalpers would sell stamps right next to bookstores. Sharp-witted intellectuals would jokingly say that the woman in white was worth 20 kilos of other junk paper. Distributing books among the most active of the paper collectors was in part handled by the All-Russian Society of Bibliophiles. Covers belonging to flashy books became the centerpiece of a proper home interior. Some people would place signs in front of them onto bookshelves saying, now don't you devour these shelves with your eyes. Nobody's letting you take these books home with you, since only an utter moron would give away books for others to take home. In May of 1975, the International Bulgarian Song Festival Golden Orpheus was held yet again at the Sunny Beach Resort. First prize was awarded to a little-known mass concert soloist. Central Television aired the conclusion late in the evening as per usual, with the grand prize winner being the last to make it out on stage. She sang about Harlequin, moved her arms around like this, and for the first time those who were still watching at that point remembered not only the song, but also the hand gestures, as well as the artist's name naturally which was Ala Pugacheva. Starting in 1975, the name of Finland's capital city acquires new meaning. In Helsinki, the heads of 35 nations sign the final act of the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe. For over two years, the final act was being sorted out by national delegations. Then for two days, national leaders were giving speeches and signing the paper, which was constructed around a declaration of the principles which participating countries were to uphold in their dealings with each other. And it wasn't just Soviet propaganda that would dub these principles as the spirit of Helsinki. No violence or threatening to resort to violence, no violating national borders, and no meddling with other countries' internal affairs. The Helsinki Act solidified the existing order in Europe. Nations agreed to warn each other in advance about large-scale military maneuvers. Much of the final act was devoted to human rights and various liberties. Those were, of course, formally mentioned in the Soviet constitution, and so initially the majority of the Soviet people didn't really take notice. By signing the Helsinki Act, the Soviet Union takes upon itself the responsibility not to interfere with the free distribution of information. Jamming the transmission of foreign radio stations with programs in native Soviet languages, which used to be standard practice in the big cities, was temporarily ceased. The saying which went, in Russia we have a tradition to listen to the BBC at night, explains the huge demand for radio receivers with a wide range of shortwave frequencies, with the most valued brands being VEF and Ocean. 
By the late 70s, the USSR would become the country with the largest amount of such receivers in the entire world, at 82 million. Listeners regarded stations such as Voice of America, BBC and Svoboda to be the most reputable. News reports given by different voices were a curious listen right after you'd just seen Vremya. In each case, the same subject matter was handled very differently. Voice of America's trademark informational analytical radio show called Events and Musings and BBC's A Glance from London provided a comprehensive rundown on the most important topics. As for what the hosts of Freedom Radio should speak about and how, and I mean all of these people, it's all spelled out in a special document. Though it is a secret document. Starting in the mid-70s, virtually every teenager who was never really even into politics begins listening to the BBC, and even makes tape recordings of seven of Garatsev's programs about rock music. In admitting the influence of the London-based DJ on the minds of the young generation, Komsomol newspapers would often try to diminish the work of Novgorodsev. Radio Swoboda, or Freedom, which was an American radio station operating from Munich, was continuously being jammed. It was considered to be severely anti-Soviet. As for their employees, well, just like Soviet immigrants on all of the other stations, they were labeled as the vilest characters recruited by foreign intelligence. Uncensored information aside, there was another aspect of foreign radio appreciated by Soviet listeners, namely a foreign manner of broadcasting. Shortwave station hosts would talk like, breaking news on the hour. They'd have disclaimers such as, America's Viking space station or Viking in Russian has traveled. Make announcements like, the fate of Soviet Jews lies in the hands of Leonid Brezhnev. Even pauses in between Voice of America's news reports themselves feel like news. And now for your listening pleasure, a song by Vladimir Vysotsky called Luka Moria is no more. The other day, 61 to 91, current era. We single out what matters the most. Moscow's Mhat, Leningrad's Bolshoi Drama Theater, and 50 others all around the country show a play based on a piece by Alexander Gelman called Minutes of a Meeting. It shared a plot with the movie The Bonus, where members of a construction brigade declined their bonuses, only for their actions to later be discussed by a party committee. From Amhat's main stage, where the play party committee meeting was being put on, a message is conveyed of moral integrity and responsibility on behalf of party members. The plot focused on a completely unorganized construction zone, where management was systematically setting low targets in order to easily meet and exceed the work plan. The construction workers were unwilling to receive bonuses for their fabricated achievements. Brigadier Potapov's merits were able to overcome the shortcomings of the economic model. He even received support from the party committee secretary, who exclaimed, We are members of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, not Trust Company No. 2's party. After which he addresses the audience with the words, Who's in favor of Comrade Potapov's proposition? This production-themed play was held in high regard for posing an urgent and relevant question. The following year, in a report given at a party congress, the play was even praised by Brezhnev himself. The number one fish product – soury and oil. This was the very best type of canned fish in a time when fresh fish wasn't available. For the purpose of internal consumption, 100 million cans were produced annually. For the domestic market, soury was packed into round cans, with the pieces fitted into them vertically in a sort of rose formation. Fishermen from the Far East often referred to soury as goldfish, both for how it tastes and its success in foreign markets. Exported soury was packed into specially shaped cans and flipped belly up. You could also get smoked soury, soury and jelly. However, regular soury and oil, inside of a can with an orange label, was in a league of its own. Hello, I'm your aunt. From 1975 and onwards, this became not only a proverb, but also the title of a movie. Hello, I'm your aunt was the fan-favorite eccentric comedy movie of the decade. 
The film adaptation of a play by Englishman Brandon Thomas was shot in a modest location, which was only slightly more roomy than a single pavilion. This comedy based around disguises wasn't about the setting or even the plot, it was all about the faces. Love and poverty have got me forever entangled in a net. But if there weren't any love around, on account of poverty I'd say no sweat. Alexander Kaliagin loses himself in the role of a man impersonating a woman, the character Aunt Charlie, while Armen Jigarkanian and Mikhail Kazakov play a couple of unlucky wooers. What's wrong, babe? I'm a bit cross. What about me? I'm an old dog of war, and I know not the words of love. After the film came out, Brazil became our nation's favorite South American country, the land of a multitude of Don Pedros and wild monkeys. 1975 marked the peak, in the fullest sense of the word, of our scientific and technological collaboration with the United States, in the form of a joint U.S.-Soviet spaceflight. On July 15th, the Soyuz-19 spacecraft, manned by Alexei Leonov and Valery Kubasov, is launched from Baikonur, with the Apollo 10 vessel simultaneously taking off from Cape Canaveral, carrying on board Thomas Stafford, Vince Brandt and Donald Slayton. Here's how the experts described the objective. Testing docking system compatibility, verifying crew transfer procedure between ships, coordinating command center activities. As interpreted by propaganda, the USSR and the USA were shaking hands in space. The two ships docked on July 19th at 1912, forming an orbital space complex called Soyuz Apollo. The hatch between the two ships with a spaceman's head poking through it, symbolizing the fact that the US and the USSR, while competing down on Earth, are on the same team in outer space. But as a matter of fact, we were competing in space as well. They were preparing expeditions to the moon, we were putting together long-distance flights, and it was unclear which nation had the upper hand. After docking, the two ships spend almost 48 hours joined together. Astronauts and cosmonauts will bring back souvenirs for the leaders of their respective countries. The main gift to the population was Soyuz Apollo brand cigarettes made by Philip Morris, which were sold in the USSR as well. So today, the last of the fruit flies perished. More and more Soviet citizens were adding something new to their morning routine aside from soap and toothpaste. Less people were cool with hearing others say something like, don't like the stench? Well, don't smell it. The Russian industrial sector begins producing a wide variety of deodorants for various purposes. Even though you could get antiperspirant pens which limited sweat secretion, aerosols were considered to be more up-to-date. Modern technology brought about the cloud in a bottle. The first domestic brands of aerosol air fresheners were called Breeze and Pine Needles and brought a faint forest aroma into people's homes. Later, to improve the smell of people's feet, they created products named Hygiene and Tulip. Aerosols for other areas of your body were called Pisserina and Flearo. As for the most popular Soviet deodorant, that would be Freshness. In Moscow, more and more high-rise apartment complexes were being built, which had a total of 16 floors. The issue with housing quantity in the capital city was considered to be more or less solved, and it was time to tend to quality. Convenience was the main requirement when it came to putting up new housing. 16-story buildings had more space in the hallway and the kitchen, there were no walk-through rooms or combined bathrooms, and each entryway had two elevators, regular and cargo. The staircase was located in a separate enclosure. All of this came together into what was referred to as an improved layout. Such housing would then slowly find its way into regional cities, where such buildings would often be called the Moscow series. On September 4, 1975, Central Television airs a new show called What, Where, When. This was a guessing game for intellectuals where experts would answer questions from viewers. These experts were handsome young people – scientists, workers, journalists and students – who were well-read and consequently very knowledgeable.
The program's creator and director Vladimir Voroshilov narrates the show from behind the scenes. What were when's mascot was an owl, the symbol of wisdom. Rare books were awarded as prizes. First prize? The Vasilyev brothers. The basic principle suggested that whoever was the smartest was in favor. Like a frog, no? The mechanics are a bit different. Frogs might see it as a potential food source and jump towards... The editorial office would be flooded with letters containing questions. Most viewers were rooting for the experts, so basically against their own team. That's how charismatic these smart guys were. With the amazing amount of knowledge they possessed, people began to enact the show in real life, like they would KVN. The country's trendiest artists would perform their songs during musical breaks. Andre Kamorin, the captain of the Lucky Six. We'll now press the spinner button and announce who is going to be quizzed by our viewers in today's program. Please, Andre. However, the leaders of two superpowers agreed on the need for initiating a dialogue. The absolute Soviet record for amount of viewers who came to see a movie during its first year in theaters was shattered. With no more credible data available on the matter but the fact that in 1975, 91 million people came to watch a Mexican melodrama titled Yesenia. The most down-to-earth characters to appear on Soviet movie screens. A few smoking hot and passionate brown-haired guys and gals in colorful clothing and settings. Beautiful names, a beautiful life, beautiful love. Albeit it takes a bit of time for the protagonists to get there. That's not really saying much. He left you, right? Answer me! In 1975, the first ever Soviet Cup competition was held in a new trendy type of sport called windsurfing. That's when you ride a board fitted with a sail. The simple idea of attaching a pole to a surfboard was conceived but just a few years prior in America. Meanwhile in the USSR, this promising sport begins to gain traction in parallel with the rest of Europe. Competitions would typically include one of two disciplines – racing or freestyle. Anybody could learn how to confidently ride a board after just five lessons with an instructor. However, with these being expensive and cumbersome vehicles, windsurfing was a hobby reserved for the well-heeled resort crowd who adorned the water bodies near beaches on stock movie footage. During the mid-70s, France was the Soviet Union's main friend in the West. That's despite the fact that we exchanged hundreds of times fewer goods with them compared to the Soviet Union's main partner in the West, which was West Germany. The Kremlin's Western policy was regarded by all as quote-unquote Byzantine, French policy as too courteous, all the while, two nations that had their nuclear warheads pointed at one another were trying to convince the rest of the world that they were friends for life. France continued to showcase its independence when it came to international affairs, with the Soviet Union displaying an example of peaceful coexistence of states with very different social order. The mutually beneficial cooperation that began when de Gaulle was still president, and carried on once Pompidou came to office, truly came to fruition during the seven-year term of President Valéry Giscard d'Estaing. Him being an aristocrat and an intellectual, d'Estaing was taken to see a ballet at the Bolshoi Theater, attended a ceremonial lunch at the Kremlin, visited Jasna Poliana, the estate of Tolstoy who he was a fan of. Brezhnev's visit to Paris was arranged with equal magnificence. He spent every night at the Rambouillet Castle, a country residence the name of which was soon pretty well known to our people. Brezhnev was greeted by veterans of the Normandy Neiman Regiment, as well as activists from the USSR France Society. After a ride around town, he speaks about how glad he is to see all of Paris's inhabitants. Exceptional political relations were all that mattered. Our propaganda would also stress the importance of a Soviet-French cultural dialogue. The French were the only people whose artistic values were deemed to be on par with our own. We'd hear gleeful statements about France fighting back against the onslaught of so-called cultural imperialism, which implied, of course, American culture. 
where everything was so alien from the perspective of our two great nations. There you had a ton of cruelty and violence in whatever movies Hollywood put out, while French cinema was all about humanism, the pitfalls of American showbiz on one hand, and traditional melodic French chanson on the other. Given that contact with the Western world was still very limited, French exhibitions, tours, movie weeks and even fortnights were an unusually common occurrence in the USSR. In 1975 marked the 30th anniversary of the Great Victory. And during a concert in honor of Militia Day, Lev Leshenko performs a song by David Tukmanov with lyrics by Vladimir Haritanov called Victory Day. This would become the eternal anthem of Soviet World War II veterans. The song was actually written two years prior. It's just that editorial boards were put off by a combination of a marching rhythm and a minor key. With it labeled as a mix of clinking wine glass and marching, the decision was made not to show Victory Day on television. But after a live performance, the TV editorial office was flooded with thank you letters and telegrams. The highest honor being questions from veterans about the young Tukmanov, along the lines of, which front lines did the song's creator do battle on? In six weeks' time, Victory Day was up there with the very best compositions at the Song of 1975 concert. On Christmas Eve of 1975, the world is shaken by news about a truly audacious terrorist act. The peaceful city of Vienna was hosting a conference attended by oil exporting countries. Members of OPEC, an organization which was mostly comprised of rich Arab nations. The terrorists took 60 people hostage at OPEC headquarters, with 11 of them being ministers. The terrorists demanded they be provided with an aircraft that would take everyone to an undisclosed country, where the hostages would be released. First they let some of the hostages go at the Vienna airport, then a few more in Algeria and Tripoli, and later, after returning to Algeria, they released the last of the hostages, namely the ministers, and surrendered to the Algerian police, who refused to turn them over to international justice. As foreign press put it, the Arabs backing the terrorists could now see for themselves that criminals aren't ones to make friends. And Soviet papers claimed that Israel was the only country standing to benefit from such operations. In 1975, the first episodes of a kid's show called Yeralash are revealed. A new format was born, since nobody in the world made kids' films quite like this one. Yeralash was meant to be the younger brother of the adult newsreel Fitil. They were even planning to call it Little Fitil. However, Alexander Kmelik and Boris Grachevsky, the creators of Yeralash, decide not to do documentary reports on the shortcomings of specific schools. Given a runtime of 10 minutes, they were able to pack three fictional anecdotes into each episode. Yeralash quickly becomes a fan favorite show both among kids and grown ups. Where are the boy's parents? He can get sick with those wet feet. What's wrong with him? Why? Why would you do something like this? Why? What's the point? Why? Here's why. It was just a joke. That was some joke. And with that, we've covered 1975 and our series The Other Day, 1961 to 1991 Current Era. Next time, we'll be doing 1976, New Passports, The Corvalon Exchange, The Irony of Fate or Enjoy Your Bath, Brezhnev Turns 70, Zita Our Gita, Mao's Death, Sunglasses, Fortified Wines, Roller Coasters, The Play Story of the Horse, The Massive Kama Automotive Plant. See you for a new episode and a new year. Farewell.